uh, Christopher Rudden, who is a PhD candidate in history at Harvard. And um, he is looking at um, uh, clothing as an extension, I guess, or externalization of the self and as a form of technology. Um, and so his, the title of his talk is Mental Health is Not Fashion, Shirt Stigma and History, which is a really uh, compelling title. So I'll go ahead, you can go ahead, Chris, and uh, tell us about your work. Just getting myself set up. Hopefully everyone can see my PowerPoint, great. All right, thank you all for coming and thank you to the organizers for having me and to our um, session chair. Um, today I will be reading selections from my paper, um, which as noted is titled, Mental Health is Not Fashion, Shirts, Stigma and Consumerism. In August 2019, the Washington Post ran a story on a growing cottage industry of what are called rest in peace t-shirts, wearable shrines to loved ones lost. These shirts, the author wrote, have become a somber material extension of the nation's social epidemics, inner city gun violence, mass shootings, drug overdoses. A phenomenon dating back to the late 1980s and early 1990s, these shirts carry many meanings. They are stories, they are calls to action, they are also commodities. Todd Smedley, the founder of T-Shirt Kings in Dayton, Ohio, told the reporter that his job was speaking up for the good things people did. They were still loved, he said. I just helped families narrate that story. Smedley elaborated that he considered the shirts to be some type of therapy, and he is not alone in making that comparison. Christian Ray, a graffiti artist known by the name Arson and an employee at Big City Fashions in Chicago, told a reporter in 2017, I'm a graffiti artist, a therapist, a financial advisor, all that. This paper begins with those statements. What does it mean for shirts to be some type of therapy? What can we learn by calling on the theories of psychotherapy to read things such as shirts? It is my contention that by doing so, we can uncover the ambivalences of using consumer technology as a means for healing. By reading memorial shirts through the methods of family and group therapy, with comparisons to other items, such as pink Susan G. Komen apparel and the AIDS quilt, I argue the materiality afforded by this technology helps externalize and disperse group trauma, a practice haunted but not impeded by larger capitalist regimes. This paper is divided into four parts. The first uses the lens of group therapy to postulate how the use of these shirts could enact group healing. While group therapy may seem at first to be the modality best suited to analyzing the use of rest in peace shirts, my analysis shows its limitations in fully comprehending the technology. The second section therefore employs the insights of structural family therapy, especially the concept of the identified patient, to show how the story of one member of a group is used to understand broader social epidemics. The third section looks at the idea of these shirts as diffusible stigma, a way of externalizing and reframing stigmatized positionalities. The final section focuses on the ambivalences of the shirts as part of a wider consumer culture, highlighting both their limitations and their unique advantages. The goal of this endeavor is not necessarily to provide answers, but to consider the merits of opening new modes of inquiry. It is thus conceived as a sort of thought experiment. How can the tools of fashion studies, history, and psychiatry come together to make sense of pressing problems? What are the limits of such an approach? And how might, how might thinking differently about objects help to imagine new ways of thinking about ourselves? While there are many types of group therapy and group counseling, the paradigmatic form is that described by Irving Yalom. The prototypical model is an intensive, heterogeneously composed outpatient psychotherapy group meeting for at least several months with the ambitious goals of both symptomatic relief and personality change. This can be modified, Yalom argued, to fit any specialized situation. A special importance is the fact that the group in group therapy is evanescent, constructed of unrelated individuals for a brief defined period of time. This section draws on Yalom's mechanism of interpersonal learning to read rest in peace shirts as a form of group therapy. I argue that one can read these shirts as a technology that strengthens interpersonal ties to mourn a life lost and that demonstrates the pathology of white supremacy in the United States. As will soon be clear, however, this lens locates pathology still in individuals, albeit in their means of relating, and therefore does not go far enough in illuminating America's social epidemics. Group therapy views the personality as the product of interactions and mental disorder as a distorted way of relating with others. In Yalom's words, psychological symptomatology emanates from disturbed interpersonal relationships, 
The task of psychotherapy is to help the client learn how to develop distortion-free, gratifying interpersonal relationships. Rest in Peace shirts attempt to control the narrative, defining who holds the diseased worldview. Elijah McLean, for instance, is portrayed in images such as this one as a soft and kind man, often by use of animal and musical imagery, owing to a story about McLean playing the violin for stray cats. Such a representation serves to highlight the injustice of his death, which featured language indicating McLean looked sketchy and had incredible, crazy strength. The artist behind one of these widely shared images told the Aurora Sentinel that, I think some people really don't want to believe that this is going on, or they'll say that somebody's almost deserving of this kind of brutality because they have some sort of criminal history. And I think Elijah's innocence and gentleness and everything I've read from people who knew him made the ridiculousness of these arguments very clear. Clothing adorned with the names of lives lost also encourages self-reflection, another key aspect of group therapy. This is encapsulated in the oft-repeated idea that such items will, quote, raise awareness. The 2020 US Open, to take just one example, featured multiple forms of just such a theme. Naomi Osaka brought seven face masks to the tournament, each featuring a name. Breonna Taylor, Elijah McLean, Amand Arbery, Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, Flandre Castile, and Tamir Rice. In her interview on court after winning the women's draw, Osaka was asked what message she was hoping to impart with the masks. Well, what was the message that you got is more the question. I feel like the point is to make people start talking. On the men's side of the draw, Francis Tiafo took the court and shoes on which he had written Black Lives Matter and say her name. Returning to the image of McLean, we can already see some tensions inherent in this form of activism. Miller noted she created the image after watching videos of protests in Aurora in June of 2020. I started research, researching his story, and it was just heartbreaking, and it put me in a state of grief learning about who he was as a person, Miller noted. He felt like somebody I would have been friends with, or had as one of my students. I was just upset and outraged and sad. There are many forms of distance between Miller and these events, especially the death itself, which occurred almost a year prior. The grief and outrage she held were likewise far removed from that of the family and those who protested in the immediate wake of the tragedy. While Miller reached out to Shanine McLean, Elijah's mother, before creating her image, Shanine posted on the GoFundMe in her son's name on February 26, 2021, to speak about the so-called community gathered there. We have so much catching up to do as a community on earth, so get close to the trustworthy and dependable, leave procrastination in the paragraphs, but change your behaviors of existence. To truly have our best change possible, we need to stop inhuman laws and lawmakers. After the structural critique, which will be discussed more in the next section, she continued, to the individuals that are still trying to profit from my son's murder, may you also be judged by Heavenly Father's divine judgments. Stop asking me about giving my approval for films, documentaries, books, or anything else with my son's name attached to it. Here we have reached one of the limits of group therapy approach. The motives for joining a group are diverse and not all are welcomed into the fold. Even the shirt worn by McLean's father, which features a simple picture of his son, is for sale on Amazon. Here, one sees no context. While Elijah's name is clear, the shirt's description also includes the words fashionable and trendy. The company notes, our awesome funny shirts are the perfect gift for any occasion. There's no mention on the page of who McLean was or who the seller is. The shirt sells for $17.99. This section applies some of the tools of Salvador Mnuchin's structural family therapy to the case of recipe shirts. By doing so, we can learn how the garments materialize social ills and point the way to new ways of relating that can begin to treat longstanding trauma. The goals of structural family therapy are simple, at least theoretically. The first is challenging the IP's ownership of the symptom, followed by making the family members responsible for maintenance of the symptom. Here, IP stands for individual patient or identified patient. The final aim of the therapy is changing the family's organization or structure. When this is achieved, the positions of members in that group are altered accordingly, leading to changes in individual experience. The patient in family therapy is the relational patterns that are created by belonging to a subsystem. The individual is not the level of analysis the system is instead. The figure emblazoned on the rest in t-shirt is akin to identified patient. The act of memorializing and printing the name or image on a shirt transforms the figure from victim to a symptom of the violent relational patterns created by belonging to a minoritized group in a society shaped by systemic anti-Black racism and white supremacy. Know how this differs from the description of pathology in the group therapy above. The problem is here located in the relations between people, not in one individual's way of seeing others. 
While the latter helps to locate responsibility in campaigns against specific police officers, for instance, the former helps highlight the broader structural system that is in need of cure. For months after George Floyd's murder, the site of his death became an impromptu memorial. In addition to tribute spaces, many vendors flocked to the area and clothing and objects featured heavily. One of the vendors, Clifford Dodd, sold hoodies, shirts, and masks adorned with Black Lives Matter and We Still Can't Breathe. Everybody has their own stories of being caught by the cops, being degraded, Dodd told reporters. And everyone came here and they were laying their pain down somewhere. Christelle Smith, who tended the flowers at the site and the candles for the dead each night, wore one such shirt, saying, I just get sad and emotional and I get to thinking about everything. Like, damn, this could have been my brother, this could have been my dad, this could have been my boyfriend. He could have been anybody. He could have been anybody because his death provides an occasion to recognize shared pain that results from larger societal structures of anti-Blackness. The pathology that causes this pain is rooted in American society. This is not to lose sight of the individual, but to acknowledge how the individual is not the problem, and instead a consequence of belonging in the American family as it now stands. What then is the solution? According to the strictures of structural family therapy, treatment proceeds by structural change. Restructuring the family occurs with therapeutic interventions that confront and challenge a family in the attempt to force the therapeutic change. And how can objects participate in structural change? One way is by making concrete new forms of relating that emphasize belonging. The rest in peace shirt emphasizes the shared nature of grief, inviting others who may not have even known the deceased personally to participate in mourning. Kyle Ng, one of the founders of the brand Brain Dead, commented on the label shirt, which read, if you love black culture, protect black lives, by saying the world is our family and we've got to help them out. Here are the example of the AIDS quilt in Instructive. Conceived in 1985, the Names Project Foundation's AIDS Memorial Quilt was first displayed in Washington, DC in 1987. Its first iteration included 1,920 panels, each representing a person who had lost their life to the disease. Over time, the quilt traveled and grew, and now it features close to 50,000 panels representing over 100 million people. In its patchwork of grave-sized squares, the quilt turns a material representation of domesticity on its head. The panels memorialize loved ones lost while making clear the domestic space was not made available to queer people, that their love could never be a private matter. Following a feminist maxim, the personal is political, the quilt thus made use of this publicity by bringing the community to the forefront of national attention. In his study of the project, Peter Hawkins noted that Cleve Jones alighted on the quilt as a, quote, domestic equivalent for a sign of national unity, a metaphor be pluribus unum that was, to recall his words, cozy, humane, and warm. Displayed on the National Mall, the quilt offered a way to suffer intimate losses in the most public space in America, to leave behind ghetto and closet, to bring mourning from the margin to the center. Many modalities of psychology and psychiatry argue that objects are crucial to understanding the self and its relation to others, and that objects can be integral to mental well being. To take just one example, William James defined the self as, quote, the sum total of all that he can call his, not only his body and his psychic powers, but his clothes and his house, his wife and children, his ancestors and friends, his reputation and works, his land and horses, and his yacht and bank account, end quote. If objects can be part of the self, they can also, I argue, be added to and removed from the self, becoming amenable to treatment. Memorial shirts and related items of clothing can thus function as mobile stigma that externalize and redefine group boundaries. I will use the example of breast cancer to illustrate this process before returning to rest in peace shirt. Sociologist Irvin Goffman defines stigma as an attribute of a stranger that makes him different from others in the category of persons available for him to be and of a less desirable kind thus reducing him from a whole and usual person to a tainted, discounted one. When one redefines the categories, however, one can have an effect on stigma. In her work on the breast cancer movement, Samantha King tracks a cultural transformation in the disease in the late 20th century United States. Breast cancer, King wrote, has been reconfigured from a stigmatized disease and individual tragedy best dealt with privately and in isolation to a neglected epidemic worthy of public debate and political organizing to an enriching and affirming experience during which women with breast cancer are rarely patients and mostly survivors." Quote. The figure in the final stage, moreover, occasions an outpouring of American generosity, one which for self becomes part of the treatment itself. King uses the term breast cancer culture to describe 
those forms of breast cancer related social identification, affiliation, and organization that exist outside the confines of social movement organizations or political action and change narrowly defined. In particular, King attends to forms of collective experience that operate beyond medical institutions. This focus on culture allows King to highlight the distinct set of signs and symbols, style even, now associated with breast cancer. These styles, note the word choice, help to create forms of collective experience, most notably in images of masses of pink clothing during the campaign signature event, a walk now known as More Than Pink. The photograph shown here, accompanying an article on money raised by the Seattle version of the event in 2017, is a case in point. The photograph features walkers in all shades of pink under a banner with the slogan, Be More Than Pink. United spatially on the road, the reference to a single cause and visually in a particular style, this community is emphasizing how pink is a way of being and more important, a way of being together. And as the imagery of the disease goes from specific to general, from the individual to the community, any one of the people in this image could be a survivor or a supporter, the stigma is lessened as it no longer serves to discount the individual person. Rest in Peace shirts, I argue, aim to act through channels similar to those of the breast cancer movement to call attention to the neglected social epidemic of anti-Black violence by extending the community who mourns such losses. Memorial shirts help craft resilience by emphasizing community. The first thing a customer for such shirt sees on the T-Shirt King's website is the following. Losing someone special in your life is tragic, and we are extremely sorry to know this. But this is how life works. You can only remember the good times you had together and life goes on. Though you can keep them alive in your memories and also through Memorial t-shirts. The company defines the shirt as following. Memorial t-shirts or RIP t-shirts as they are known are normal t-shirts made special by the picture printed on it. Whether you're planning a get together in memory of the deceased or just wanna make them part of your life when they are no longer here, Memorial t-shirts are a good way to do so. Getting together is an important part of the shirt's function. They are made to be seen by others who in the act of looking participate in the act of remembrance. Moreover, the sellers make clear that the shirt will make the lost loved one a part of your life when they are no longer here, a long lasting physical reminder that becomes a part of oneself. As the site goes on to say, you can pay respect to the lost person in many ways. Flowers and memorials are a one-time thing, but a yearly get together with memorial t-shirts to remember the happy times is an entirely different emotion. Accompanying the shift from stigmatized conditioning to cause celebre and perhaps concomitant with it is a rise of corporate interests. As King noted, commodities surrounding the breast cancer movement, such as the race of shirts, transform purchasers into certain kinds of people living certain kinds of lives, producing consumer citizens in the process. King argued breast cancer helped usher in the current preoccupation with consumer-oriented philanthropic solutions and social problems, a concern that's part of a broader reconfiguration of the neoliberal state. This is one in which boundaries between the state and the corporate world are increasingly blurred as each elaborates the interests of the other, often in dispersed sites throughout the social body through practices that misleadingly appear to be outside the realms of government and consumer capitalism. The same process is happening in the world of memorial tees. In the next section, we will pick up on the themes of consumerism, conflict, and cure to illustrate how the market both helps and hurts quests for healing. Gucci opened its 2019 Fashion Week show in Milan with a statement. Models dressed in white jumpsuits resembling straight jackets were lined up on a conveyor belt, everything around them stark white. According to Alessandro Michel, the designer behind the show, this most extreme version of a uniform dictated by society was supposed to represent a blank slate, how, quote, through fashion, power is exercised over life to eliminate self-expression, end quote. The bold colors and patterns that followed were thus meant to emphasize the opposite point. As the designer told the New York Times, I wanted to show how society today can have the ability to confine individuality and that Gucci can be the antidote. One model, however, had a statement of their own. Aisha Tan Jones wrote, mental health is not fashion on their hands and held them up as a form of silent protest. Tan Jones wrote later that, quote, presenting these struggles as props for selling clothes in today's capitalist climate is vulgar, unimaginative, and offensive. Today's capitalist climate has certainly loomed large in the background of this paper. This example dramatically illustrates, however, the complex effects of consumer capitalism. Yes, the addition of corporate interests has led to conflict as fashion and the broader social structure it represents can be used to erase the individual. However, clothing as an object both public and profoundly private does offer an antidote of sorts. Clothes can be a language of the unconscious, allowing for forms of expressing your innermost desires. 
the section thus begins to unpack the ambivalences of consumer citizenship related to technologies peeling. Medical historian Nancy Toms argued in her 2016 monograph on patient consumer that the intertwining of medicine and business has existed for over a century. The seemingly modern idea of critical consumerism, the movement to protect and inform consumers, instead dates back to progressive era worries over a proliferation of new medical technologies and claims, as we heard in the presentation this morning. While resting on a faith in the power of the well-informed patient, Toms argues this critical consumerism is plagued by the difficulty of separating it from its uncritical counterparts or from other meanings of consumerism. Citing the American Heritage Dictionary, Toms identifies two other definitions. The theory that a progressively greater consumption of goods is economically beneficial and attachment to materialistic values or possessions. Moral assurance, I argue, are subject to the same inextricability of these different strands of consumer logic. We have seen examples indicating the perhaps single-minded focus on money surrounding these items of clothing. However, turning to consumer psychology indicates the presence of another threat I want to emphasize, one hidden in a different rating of the third definition, attachment to possessions. While the example sentence given, deplored the rampant consumerism of contemporary society, indicates the view that such attachment is deplorable, some theorists argue that attachment is necessary to human functioning, and in particular, that attachment to possessions is an important step in developing healthy relationships. Russell W. Belk, who built on James's definition of the self to argue for an extended self as being critical to consumer psychologists, argued possessions play a major role in the maturation and maintenance of one's sense of self. Quoting human geographer Yi Fu Tuan, Beck argued, our fragile sense of self needs support, and this we get having and possessing things because, to a large degree, we are what we have and possess. Moreover, Beck argued possessions are essential even for those with a healthier and more stable sense of self and in fact contribute to such stability. As an objective manifestation, manifestation of the self, possessions help us manipulate our possibilities and present the self in a way that garners feedback from others who are reluctant to respond so openly to the unextended self. The role that objects play in the development of the self, some argue, occurs on larger scales as well such as in political theorist Bonnie Honig's conception of public things as the foundation of democratic society. Memorial shirts are an example of a public thing, one that creates communities through memorialization. A newspaper story on rest in peace shirts from 2017 opened with the story of Quentin Harris and his brother Julian, who was shot and killed seven years prior. While Quentin was unable to mourn his brother at the time, he now holds annual celebrations as part of, quote, the unending process of grieving. Each year, as part of the event, he commissions a new memorial shirt. Quentin opined that his brother's children might only remember their father through these customized shirts. It feels like I'm giving him a second life, Harris said, like he'll never really be gone as long as I can help it. Typically worn at such memorial gatherings or shared on social media, the shirts are meant to be looked at, held, kept. As one designer noted, he felt the biggest way he could reach people was to make merchandise that's obtainable. Someone could see someone else wearing it and it could go on and on. However, the public these things bring, the expanded family system they create, necessarily includes businesses making and selling the shirts. This addition is an uneasy one, especially when people institutions behind the shirts are not readily apparent. Nearly every newspaper article published about memorial shirts either mentions or focuses on some form of the question in the words of this one headline, is it okay to sell Brianna Taylor t-shirts? When do attempts to raise awareness cross the line and become commodification? The status of these shirts as consumer goods therefore raises questions of ownership. Who owns these shirts? Who owns this grief? Here we see the clear constraints of expanding the family system through material means. There's clearly lots of money to be made in this consumer ecosystem, but not all relations are symbiotic. This consumerism cannot be economically beneficial in general because of the economic system itself that is structured by the same forms of systemic inequality that make the shirts necessary in the first place. Gun violence, for instance, has been found to have a strong relationship with income inequality. For these public things to imagine new publics, they must confront the system as well, which would mean as a start, directing money only into the communities affected by these multiple forms of violence. In this paper, I've read rest in peace shirts using the tools of group and structural family therapy. These shirts are productively unstable objects, crossing boundaries and full of diverse meanings. Some of the designers of the shirts refer to their work as some type of therapy. And while group therapy might seem at first to be a helpful frame of reference to think about the shirts in light of this comment, 
its, its theories reinforce the individual pathology of social epidemics. The lens of structural family therapy, on the other hand, allows for a shift in perspective to the disordered relational patterns between people. This also indicates a possible point of intervention in changing how individuals in a broader American family relate to one another. Memorial shirts help expand the family, inviting more people to mourn those lost and changing the narrative through memorialization and destigmatization. As commodities, however, they risk commoditizing death itself and reinscribing the larger inequalities that lead to differential death rates in the first place. This extended thought experiment has opened to new ways of looking at objects that have sadly become all too familiar. Thank you all, and I look forward to hearing your questions and comments. Thank you, Christopher. That was really, really nice. Um, I uh, open it up to comments, and I'm sure there'll be many questions and comments. I guess I'll just, I'll start out with, um, you know, as I was listening to you and reading what you wrote, you know, how, where do we put the, where do we place the rules, <laughs> you know, to sort of slip from uh, these, these items as being um, healing items versus commodities, like how, how is that managed or regulated? Thank you. It's a, it's a good question. And I think one of the things is that I've worked on this project and have been talking to people about it and thinking about it. I think one of the things that makes it interesting, but also makes it difficult to wrap my head around is the fact that these are items that by nature don't allow those sorts of rigid distinctions. And I think one of the things I think about in my, lar my larger work is this idea of clothing as being situated on the uneasy boundary between self and other, um, this uneasy kind of boundary space. And they also exist, I think, on the boundary space of other places as well. And I think we have a diverse group of technologies at this workshop. And it is to say that, so they also exist in this kind of weird boundary of medical object and non-medical object. Um, they place a weird boundary of consumer object and often a craft object made by someone. Because mm -hmm. um, some of these are very much mass market made, but a lot of them, a lot of the stories that reach the newspapers focus on small locally owned shops that make these shirts or people making them for themselves. And so they cross the boundaries of craft work, of fashion, of all these different kind of areas. And so I, I have the same question you have, um, often when I think about these shirts and what I think is so generative about them is precisely the fact that there is no answer to that question or no easy answer at least. Yeah. Any thoughts or comments from the... You made me think of tattoos. How, how would you, how would you kind of sort of contrast to the, the, uh, the shirts and the tattoos? Another very good question and, and I, have been thinking a lot, especially with um, paper this morning about tanning, about the, and it's something I think about a lot, the relationship between skin and fashion, between tattoos and fashion, the different levels of permanence that these symbols have on bodies that walk around in space, the different kind of visibilities that these different kind of objects have. And I think tattoos are interesting in the sense that they are often more message-based than what we would consider a normal item of clothing. I always wonder when I present these things, I always way overthink what shirt I'm gonna wear um, <laughs> because I'm talking so much about how shirts communicate. Um, whereas tattoos have a kind of more direct um, rest in peace is, is pretty, a pretty common tattoo, um, other kind of messages of meaning. And what is interesting about those is that you can kind of see in comparing tattoos and clothing how uneasy that boundary between self and other is. Tattoos we would consider, you might imagine people considering them to be part of themselves um, in a way that people might be less inclined to consider their clothing and then even less consigned to consider their yacht and bank account as William James put it. Um, and so that boundary and where that kind of cutoff between self and other occurs is very interesting. But I think tattoos is an interesting case because it indicates mm -hmm. how proximity to the body, permanency, but also visibility all kind of factor into the way that communicates part of your internal dialogue to those around you externally. Mm -hmm. 
Any other comments? Rachel, yes. Yeah, sorry, this is kind of half formed, but um, I wonder if you're thinking at all about the, um, about mobility, like how the, if, if the shirt is a technology, how it's moving and how that matters. Um, because I'm thinking about the fact that, you know, um, I think it was the question about tattoo, well, tattoos as well, but I was thinking more of murals, which are more stationary, um, obviously on a side of a building within a community. Um, and so, yeah, I, I can't totally formulate the question, but I wonder if you just have any thoughts on um, the fact that um, this is a technology that circulates. Yeah, I think, thank you for that question. It's a very interesting one. And I think especially murals are play a big role, especially in this particular story that I talked a bit about today. Um, but I think one of the interesting things about mobility is the fact that you can get places where multiples of the shirts exist next to each other, which amplifies their visual impact. And you see this a lot in protests or marches. And in the example of the um, Susan G. Komen be more than pink walk that I showed. All the pink shirts together send a message that is connected to but different than one pink shirt alone. And so I think the idea of the movability and the even the movability of a lot of this kind of debate talks about how these shirts can be kept in a drawer and kind of kept around and then be brought out and worn. Um, and then the talks about how people will see them and like think more about them. There was a op-ed piece in the LA Times by a reporter there who saw Naomi Osaka's what he called max, masktivism and then was prompted on his own journey to look for such articles of clothing. Um, and so there's movability both from the private to the public and there's movability in gatherings. Um, and of course, um, following a talk about kind of media and social media, things like murals and shirts also then become even more mobile in forms of pictures and sharing on social media sites as well, which grant them even another form of mobility. I think Fiona had a, a complimentary uh, comment. Or Thank you. It's similar to Rachel. It's a little bit half-baked at the moment, but um, the whole time you were presenting, I I've been reading a lot about roadside memorials um, and informal memorials. Um, and a lot of the tensions that you were bringing up are sort of similar tensions that come up in discussions about roadside memorials, like the tension between what the immediate family wants versus what is the effect on the general public who have no relation to the person um, and who sh whose responsibility it should be to regulate these memorials and that kind of thing. Um, and I, I guess there there isn't really a question, but um, yeah, with, with Rachel's point, I was just wondering, um, I guess like what you might borrow from that um, and, and if that might be like a potential pathway for you to, to look at. Yeah, thank you. I This is a newer project for me and so I'm always looking for kind of cases to help look at it because not a lot of people have studied these rest in peace shirts. Um, but yeah, I think roadside and public memorials and the kind of tension you pull out of what the family wants and the effects on others are also very visible in the case of memorial shirts. And especially there have been some highly publicized cases of families of these victims um, becoming upset at the selling of these shirts, like the example of Shanine McLean that I indicated earlier. But yeah, it's, I think I think a lot of these questions are helping me think more about other kinds of ways in which these comparisons are helpful, like tattoos with roadside memorials in terms of permanence, mobility, and the kind of different publics that these different families, different groups these serve. Richard. Hi, Chris. Um, enjoy that. Enjoy the paper as well. I guess I have a, a follow-up to the follow-up, which is sort of similar, a little bit half-baked, um, but just sort of thinking about this. I had a... Um, Years ago, I was, you know, with some friends, and we had a, a fairly heated discussion about um, these T-shirts on, on Mission College and Hillman College. Of course, Mission College was, you know, the fictional, historically black college from school days, fame, and, and Hillman was from, um, you know, a different world. And you know, there was sort of a, a very spirited back and forth about um, whether these shirts were were doing more harm than good, and you know, who was getting the money from these shirts and in sort of an approximation or appropriation rather of, of, of blackness in, in certain spaces. And, you know, some, some 
people were saying, well, you know, back behind the scenes, there's probably some some white person who's benefiting and, and making a whole lot of money off of these images of, of blackness. And, and, you know, it was just something interesting and something that I thought about when I was reading you know, your piece. And, you know, others, you know, argue that, uh, you know, they're the money that's going into these shirts could go to to, to scholarships, and 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 so there's a there's a, a very rich history to to I think some of these questions that you're raising. I don't know of anyone else who sort of thought about these questions of of sort of t-shirts at least within within the conversation of uh, historically black colleges and fictional historically black colleges. So that's an an angle, something broader that you could think about as well. Um, I was just thinking about the mobility piece that um, Fiona and Rachel was bringing up. And I, more recently, I've been seeing these, I guess you would call it RIP window shields, <laughs> you know, in sort of in the back of, of people's cars. Um, there's sort of, you know, RIP whoever. And so that's sort of a, a sort of another interesting take up of mobility that seems also to be connected to some of these, um, these shirts that you're talking about, um, that we see these sort of um, you know, traveling, you know, RIP images, you know, across the roadways, you know, everywhere that we go and how that has taken, you know, different form and different shape over the course of the last 10 years or so. So again, more, more so of a comment than a question. Yeah, thank you. Very helpful in thinking about, again, lots of different ways into this issue. And I think all of these kind of comments about murals, about temporary memorials, about these RIP kind of badges in cars make me think even more about the kind of special case of shirts as something that can be, and I mentioned this already, but either folded away and put in a drawer or put on the body and carried around with you. And so there's something, and that's where I think I look at objects broadly, but I think clothing becomes this very interesting case of mobile across the public private boundary in a way that a public memor a memorial on the side of a highway is less so um, the car one, some if it's in a garage, and that one comes with different kinds of visibility questions as well. But th this is all very helpful to kind of think about and very interesting to hear everyone and how it reminds you of different things that you've seen. So that's very helpful, very helpful. Thomas. Uh, Thomas, you're on mute still. You're good. Yeah, sorry. Uh, ah. Yeah, uh, sorry, my, my screen was doing strange things. Um, just uh, uh, another thought about what's special about clothing, and you brought it up in your paper. It's the, the connection to the person who's wearing the clothing. So that makes it quite different from murals or anything else. It's a form of self-presentation as a form of identification of, of building one's identity. And in, in that it is also close to the aspect of the consumer or consumerism uh, of choice. So you, you're choosing to, to be a certain person to or show yourself as a certain person by choosing a certain style, certain uh, clothing. So just as uh, a comment on what is special about this case. Yeah, there's a lot of different kinds of roles at play here. And so one of the things you do when you put on one of these moral t-shirts is you are self-presenting as a certain kind of person. You are aligning yourself with certain groups and ideas. And that has led to conflict in some regards if people think in terms of slacktivism, but it also does have a very powerful form of, as you note, self-presentation self and kind of self-construction that putting on the clothes we do each morning has this very deep rooted sense of constructing the self and therefore makes it very powerful and very personal in a way that like, yeah, these other conditions are, are less so. My husband wears a lot of uh, peace and human rights uh, t-shirts in his leisure time. And my sister tells him he's gonna save the world one t-shirt at a time. So I don't know if that's a fair comment, but uh, I'm gonna keep my promise and I'm gonna circle back uh, to Antoine and uh, Gilbert Matt has a question um, and he's a, a pharmacist for many years. Gilbert, do you want to uh, 
ask your question and unmute. He's here, I can see him. <laughs> so maybe while he's doing that, um, his question was, uh, Antoine, when you when a topic emerges um, from the uh, the R, the risk uh, website, uh, you, you wanted to know more about the, the the circling back to I guess the regulatory agencies. Like at what point um, uh, there would be more of an investigation into into a uh, uh, an adverse effect that uh, came from this really interesting source of information. Yes, I. Um... You know, I, I think both with, um, you know, more traditional pharmacovigilance schemes and with the risk database, that's always an element in which there's a lot of discretion involved. I mean, usually just the reporting system accumulates reports and they're added to a database. And there's some point at which for some reason, because there is, I don't know, because one case attracts attention, there is uh, a decision to go back to the database and, and search for a certain kind of, 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 of issue. Um, you know, I guess with systems that have a lot of you know, very large numbers of reports, you can imagine, and I think that's being developed, uh, um, kind of automated systems to mine the database and see if certain effects just mm -hmm. emerge or there's a signal emerging, even though no one asks the question. That's not happening in the case of risk and the database is a smaller one. So it's very much the decision of, you know, the sort of medical team at risk and it's just a couple of people. Um, but really in one case, I mean, the case I, I mentioned, it can be just a single report, right? So that was the case in the, with the issue of, uh, of alcohol dependence on SSRIs. It was this one case of this one, you know, woman I, I, I mentioned that, you know, really, brought it to light. And it was again, like, you know, one particular story that seems compelling in its sort of narrative complexity and, and, and texture that, you know, att attracted attention. And then later on, uh, it, they went back to the database and found about another, I think in that case, they found 99 or 100 other cases, or 99 other cases. And so they had 100 cases that they wrote a paper about more as a sort of, you know, old fashioned sort of case series. But so it's very much at the discretion of the researchers. And again, I do think that in the case of risk, there is more openness to just like one particular story because of its you know, compelling nature to sort of lead the, uh, or open the investigation, as opposed to perhaps systems that rely more on big data where it would have to be mm -hmm. maybe some kind of quantitative threshold or some you know, machine generation of a signal that then you know, begs for more investigation. So they have to read through the narratives. It, it sounds like themselves, right? It's not a not just a yes, mining they, AI yeah. type of thing. Yeah. Yes, they do. And then usually again, you know, when there is one particular case that comes to light, may come either as a report or because, you know, or through some other, or you know, but two of them are practicing clinicians as well. Mm -hmm. So it's things they may encounter in their own practice or, or hear from colleagues, and then it may prompt a, 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 a investigation to uh you know, to look for more evidence in the database. But, yeah. And I think uh, Rachel may have had a, a question for you as well. It, it's been a while, so you may have forgotten your question, Rachel. Yeah, I had to... <laughs> oh, I, I think I was just interested in um, if there was something about depressed and anxious pa patients being um, like particularly uh, unreliable. What did I say here? But I was thinking about themes of patients, compliance, reliability in medicine, uh, the long history of dismissing women's reporting around um, side effects related to birth control. Um, I know Keith Whalu also uh, writes about the pain gap um, and how that's more a prescription issue than a side effect issue. But still, um, I think, you know, are there patients who's, uh, who are more likely to be um, not dismissed as anecdotal in their reporting? Uh, my suspicion is yes, but I don't know if you have any way of speaking to that. Well, I, I, I think you're right. And I think there's many different ways that, you know, different constructions of the reliable patients. Um, but I think it is right and certain, and it, and it can be along, you know, lines of gender, class, and education, and, 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 and race, and so on. But, but I do think you're right about certain conditions. I, I think in the case of depression, it's one of those conditions where you do kind of have a ready-made explanation if you're a suspicious doctor to just say that you know the problem is your is with the patient rather than with the with the treatment, right? That you know the, the constant complaining is because you know because again like the, the, the patient is problematic rather than the, the treatment itself, and that was 
that was constantly the explanation given of of patients who you know ex exhibited suicidal behavior or other you know intense anxiety or agitation is, is to say like well no it's the underlying condition it's not the drug meant to treat the the condition it was the same thing in the case of the the alcohol dependence issue of this this one woman who complained against her you know ever growing dependence on alcohol and she will still know these are drugs to treat alcoholism so it can't be the drug causing it so you know you're an alcoholic so probably you know and 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 blaming it on some on something else is always what we uh, you know what you do if you're if you're an alcoholic right so instead of taking responsibility or so i think there's these you know narratives that you know provide a ready-made explanation for a doctor who <clears throat> was not inclined to listen to the patient or ready to dismiss the the accounts that <clears throat> are available in the case of certain conditions perhaps not so much of others then. So thank you both, Chris and Antoine, for really compelling presentations. I'm going to pass it to Thomas because I'm sure he's got some comments, closing comments. And yeah, my main comment is thank you very much. Thank you, Kaveri. Thank you uh, to both of the speakers, Chris and Antoine. Uh, it was a great uh, intellectual experience again. And uh, is there are there any questions for terms of organization? If not, I think we uh, can just say that we will meet again tomorrow at 9.30. Please come. And uh, for another set of four very interesting papers. And at the very end of the day, we're trying to pull everything together or we see what we make of it. Well, we don't know yet. But before that, we will have uh, four more very fascinating papers. I'm very much looking forward to that too. Thanks for being here and uh, have a nice evening. Unfortunately, we cannot spend it together. Mm -hmm.